What's up, everybody? This is Trista. Please subscribe to This League. Tap the bell, comment below, and give us a like. On this episode of This League, bitches just got closed out. A lot of them. A lot of them. We talk about them all. Few teams are now going fishing, going golfing, going to the Hamptons, going to the Bayou, wherever the fuck they're going. They're going somewhere. We break down what went wrong or what went right and give a slight preview of what's to come. We also talk about more. Those teams out West still slugging it out. I mean, the East is fucking weak. The fact that it was just gentlemen sweeps and sweeps, gross. So Marty, do me a favor and drop that Mickey Mouse beat. Dearly beloved, we gather here today on this solemn occasion to mourn the end of Trader Danny, the GM who only ever wanted to fleece you and grew so widely despised that teams and players reportedly took less valuable deals just to screw him over. The man who refused to make the hard choices to fix a ship everyone and their mother knew was sinking. And the man who, rather than do what is necessary to help his struggling coach, chose to be clever, too cute, and took the organization down with him. Rest in paradise, Danny Ainge. Seriously, though, he got swept on a Tuesday night, and by Wednesday morning, the entire organization had been fucking dismantled. <laughs> Woj bombs, Shams bombs, Haynes bombs. <laughs> Blew it up from the fucking top down. Yeah, it was a crazy, crazy blast. Crazy way to start the day. Happened at what, like 10 30 a.m.? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like right after I got in, yeah. Actually, like 12 hours. 12 hours after you got swept. <laughs> right, yeah. It yeah, had yeah. all just just blown the fuck up. Yeah, because Sons Lakers started at 10. Yeah, yeah. Right after them, yeah. <laughs> that just tells you it was a long time coming. A long time in motion for a while. Let's just take a pause. Pause. What did I fucking say? I've been saying this all year. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. I am the oracle of the NBA regarding the Boston Celtics. <laughs> I predicted this pretty much this to a T. Anything that you could predict, because there is something that you would not have ever been able to predict in any circumstance. I have the receipts. Marty, play the clip. Here's what I think happens. I think ownership gets a little tired of Danny Ainge. They say, hmm, let's start fresh. Let's find someone who can make some moves that doesn't have a reputation for being toxic and a thief. And we can actually make trades to help this team during the season. But the world was like, Trista, you're, you're cynical. You hate the Celtics. Things aren't even that bad. We're an actual good organization. We could go to the Eastern Conference Finals. We were just in the Eastern Conference Finals last year. Brad is our guy. Getting rid of Danny Ainge will never happen. Do you remember that? Getting rid of Danny Ainge will never happen. The world told me that, Marty. Didn't they? Yeah. You said that. I pretty Might sure said that. pretty sure I probably disagreed with you when you said it. Yeah. That was March 22nd, three days before the trade deadline. <laughs> three days later, on March 25th, at the trade deadline, apparently Danny Ainge informed ownership he was stepping down at the end of the year. <laughs> hmm. In an alternative universe... Here's what I think could have happened. Danny wasn't able to get Vucevic, Harrison Barnes, Harrison Barnes, Harrison Barnes, Aaron Gordon. And instead, they got the great French hope, fucking Evan Fournier, which I knew and you knew and the whole world knew was not a great option for the TPE. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> and they were like, eh, your time is up. Your time is up. And as an aside, as a quick aside for people who don't know how these things go, this is how it goes. When you come to the end of the road with an organization and you're as high up and as esteemed as Danny Ainge, because he is esteemed, has a long reputation. The organization says, here's what's going to happen. You're going to say you've been thinking about this for a long time. You're going to say something in your past led you to think about maybe retirement. That for Danny Ainge was his 2019 heart attack. And that is exactly what Danny Ainge said. In 2019, I had a heart attack and all of a sudden... I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. And we were so good that I just didn't want to do it. Now, now things are calling. And you have this 
what it will be is like a two and a half month long negotiation between the Celtics and Danny Ainge in terms of what the messaging is going to be. And now the messaging is firm and Danny Ainge is fucking out. Brutal. And then I don't know this for a fact, but Brad Stevens basically was, quote unquote, tired of coaching since the bubble. He was exhausted. Young guy, exhausted from coaching (laughs) basketball. And he's like, I'm burnt the fuck out. And then I do kind of buy that a little bit. Do you? A little bit. I mean, with the bubble and then going straight from that right into the 72 game season, it's it. It's been a lot, you know, if there was already, you know, stuff on his mind. Long off season now, though, isn't it? Out the first round, you had some time. Um, And then instead of uh, Brad just stepping down, somehow Brad got a promotion. He was tired of and ineffective, we'll say, at leading troops, inspiring troops. I said, you can't motivate. You can't motivate a fucking can of paint let alone superstars like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And it's like, instead of you being like, well, maybe you need to figure your own self out and go take a mental health year, sit with some teams, get your head right. They were like, no, no, lead the entire mission, uh, Brad Stevens. (laughs) What? What? We love what you're doing. Just, we're going to give you more power, more money, and more responsibility. Are you fucking kidding me? That certainly was the most surprising part about all this, that Stevens was, A, that like, I mean, I, I don't think we had like a huge inkling that he would be gone, but we certainly didn't think he would stay on. In, I thought he would be gone. Okay, but like it would, him becoming the president of the team, I, I don't think anyone had that in mind. You are so right. Even I could not have forecasted that fucking banana move, that fucking bananas move. Yeah. But you know who else couldn't forecast it? Dropping breaking news right before this recording. Other front office members inside of the Boston Celtics organization also didn't foresee it. Why? In late breaking news, apparently at least one major Celtics executive lobbied to fire Brad Stevens midseason. An opposing exec told SNY that he wanted to fire Stevens immediately, but that Danny Ainge was among those who lobbied to keep him. The exec further noted, a lot of us thought that Ainge and or Stevens may be let go, but I certainly did not see Brad moving upstairs. (laughs) Wow. Hmm. To go from that close to being fired? To being the head of the organization, not just a new job, the top job. <sighs> I mean, Co- what, highly coveted job. Highly coveted job. GM of the Boston Celtics organization. Plenty of names that would have taken that well, gig. I, I would say that's one of the more highly coveted jobs in the entire league. Yeah. In probably all of sports. It's close. Yeah. 13 and 13 after the trade deadline. Has anyone failed upwards faster than Brad Stevens? <laughs> How do you go from almost being fired to being promoted? Not just promoted, pushed to the top, top, tippy top, best job in sports. He basically said, Steve Nash, hold my fucking beer. Okay, let's okay. bring Steve into it. <laughs> I can't believe this. This is a disaster. This is maybe worse. This is worse than even I, who was doomsday on the Boston Celtics all year long. I think episode two was when I was like, things are bad there. Like, things are really bad there. (laughs) I do kind of remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. Like, I kept, I think we've talked about this being a disaster for like 10 shows. And you know what? Rightfully fucking so. Rightfully so. They dismantled the organization 12 hours after they got swept. Man. And then a little nugget of new news was that NBA GMs after the fact say that Boston will look to trade their most coveted and tradable asset, Marcus Smart, in the offseason. I don't need to show receipts to know that I've been saying that all season. We all know I've been <laughs> saying that all season. The world knows I've been saying that all season. But but Trista, he's the heart and soul of this team. Listen, folks, let me make this clear. Very, very clear. There is no heart and soul of the Boston Celtics organization. This team is dead. This organization is a shell. There is no soul. There is no heart. There is no life. It's Jason Tatum, and that's it. You literally just upended your entire franchise and are having a fire sale for Marcus Smart, for Kemba Walker, who knows who else? Who knows who else? 
it is just Jason Tatum playing his best impression of Will Smith walking into an empty house come preseason. That's that's what it will be. <laughs> Everything must go. Everything. Especially Marcus Smart. You know, you know, if Brad Stevens is the one leading this team and leading this franchise into the direction that they're going to go, he watched, he had a front row seat watching Marcus Smart go three for 19 from three in the last two games. <laughs> he knows what Marcus Smart is capable of. That, he knows what his upside is. That is funny. That was the la- the final impression. <laughs> that is kind of funny. That man's gone. That man is gone. If they can get anything for him, he is gone. And people are even saying now that they might not even be able to get a first round for him. What do you do then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not getting a great first round. Like you're not getting. You're getting like a late first round for yeah. Marcus Smart, and then everyone's gonna Maybe be like, late no. lottery, late lottery. <sighs> yeah, <sighs> so brutal. And the other high value asset guy every delusional ass Boston fan thinks that they can get a boatload for glue guy, Kemba Walker. New news came out on that. This all dropped all at once, by the way. New news came out that GMs believe that Kemba Walker is considered a negative asset. Yeah, I mean, I I, I saw that, too, going around Twitter and like, I mean, duh. duh. Wait, wait. Duh. Yeah. It's yes. One of the worst contracts in the league. This it's is, Kevin yeah. Love and Kemba Walker. Hey, hey, Those are the two worst contracts in the NBA right now. Hey, breaking John Wall, bad contract. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Gonna have to send picks in order for another team to take Kemba Walker. Yeah. Which, tough. Very tough. Look, yikes. Also, another bit of news that dropped all at the same time. The great French hope, Evan Fournier, the guy you use your TPE for, he is requesting upwards 20 to 25 million a year. They are not re-signing Evan Fournier. And if they do, they are fucking idiots. They're idiots. <laughs> so to recap, just to recap for folks who that was a lot of information for all at once, Smart, Smart is probably getting traded. Fournier probably isn't re-signing. You're going to have to be offloading picks in order for another team to take Kemba Walker because his contract is inedible to even the worst, most trash franchises like the Houston Rockets. It's pretty much, pretty much what? Everything I've been saying all year. Everything. I know. Can you just give it to me? Marty, just say, Tristy, you, you were right. Just say it. I mean, you were right about these two things. Yes. <laughs> I was right about the, about, we'll call it the bird's eye view of the league I've been right about. The bird's eye view. But what I've been wrong about, we'll Celtics. talk about later, about the Celtics. <laughs> yes. But Celtics fans just don't want to listen. And you know what? All I really have ever wanted was to hear that, Marty. No caveats, though. I just wanted, with this news, Trista, all year long, people were telling you you were delusional and you were right. Yep. (laughs) Just show me your belly. Let me put my boot on your neck. I won't push hard. All I want to do is just the vindication that I was right, because that's all I care about. That's all I care. (laughs) All right. So, um, of course, we're going to be speculating in the offseason about about who's going to take Brad Stevens' job. So, Stevens is going to be interviewing probably internal candidates. If I had to guess... I'd guess that Larinag is probably going to be the one that comes on. He'll probably be the first one they talk to for sure. I kind of like the idea of uh, Atkinson a little bit. And Love ha- Atkinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I could just see him in Celtics green. For sure. I just could. Uh, and Becky Hammond would be interesting that for would, sure. Yeah. I mean, Boston is not the most open to new ideas. Uh, they did have, <laughs> they did have um, a female assistant who's now coaching the women's team at Duke. The other choice is, oh boy, Lloyd Pierce being on this list at six to one. He was pretty much disliked by, I mean, he's terrible. He was terrible. Like we see how good this Hawks team could be. I know you left, but like no, he no, no, was. No, 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 for sure. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they, 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 they did him. not enjoy him. They, yeah. <laughs> no one liked him. It was like the guy that everyone calls Sergeant Nate McMillan is more liked by this organization and these teams, this, these teammates, than than Lloyd Pierce. I mean, that just tells you everything you need to know. Also, Jeff Van Gundy. Jeff Van Gundy? Jeff Van Gundy. Jeff Van Gundy. Yeah, no, that's... That's just absurd. <laughs> the fact that he's on that list is ludicrous. Yeah. Um, let's just break down Jay Laranega for a second. 40-something-year-old X's and O's guy, coach's son, inspirational speaker, been tabbed for coaching superstardom since he played like D3 and coached overseas. He coached, he coached uh, uh, the Ireland team. So TD Garden's like nothing to him. <laughs> the TD Garden vibes is nothing. It's like, what? Well, you- he really coached the Irish national team. That is funny. <laughs> He's like, Ugh. I mean, you think TD Garden's bad? Like, come to Ireland. No disrespect. What a wild Shout move out that Pat would Burke. be. Shout out Pat Burke. Shout out. Dan Tony. I mean, pff, if you were happy, 
If you were excited as a Celtics fan watching 143, 137 losses, then Dan Tony's the guy for you. Like, Dan Tony is that guy. Just no defense, uh, just all offense. So, so many things breaking down. I cannot wait to watch the rest of the chips fall. I will be watching closely because bad moves will ins- it will ensue. I promise that. Man, is it hard to like LeBron sometimes. <laughs> The world thinks I'm a LeBron (laughs) hater, but God damn. Fuck, dude. How are you going to leave the game down 32 with 542 left? He had to get treatment, Trista. Ankle injuries are tough. Yeah, he had to get treatment. They are tough. Yeah, he would have gotten the same treatment if they were up 30. We know this. They would have gotten this. He would have gotten the same, but more to the point, he would have gotten the same treatment if they were tied. (laughs) <laughs> he would have gotten the same treatment if they were tied. He needed that treatment at seven, at whatever it was, 982, whatever the fuck. No. From opening tip, we knew. We knew, right? We knew as soon as AD was ruled out, it was going to be a molly wop in well, the valley. And you, you could tell watching the game, LeBron came out. And so like, I've kind of noticed LeBron, he has... Like several tiers that he goes through, like throughout a game, where and he like he like saves up to use like that god tier. Yep. And it looked like from the opening tip, he just knew like no god. I have to no. Well, well, it looked like he he tried to go that like full game, and he did in the first like five six minutes. And I was like, this is good. Like he's not going to be able to do this. He's going to get tired and stuff. And surely enough, like that's what happens when you're 36, not 26. He could go full god mode for an entire game. Uh, when he was that age, yeah. 26, but not now. I mean, he's still great. He still managed it great, but it just, without AD, they're, they're just bad. They're just a bad team without AD. They are a bad team yeah. without AD. I talked to a PT guy, because like I said, I'm doing this ankle treatment, so every, every time I go in, I ask him yeah. about athletes' injuries, and he was like, I promise you this. LeBron knows this team is going nowhere without AD, so they have given up. They have decided they are done for the year. They are n- no more. Uh, the weirdest thing, and I don't, I think you had an issue with it or you thought it was weird that I asked this question in the group chat, but Chris Paul playing with one arm up 30, somehow playing in the game. Why was he still out there? Because it was early third player. You don't pull players early third. Typically. You do when they, you do when you're up 30 and Chris Paul has been battling an injury, an injury. That's, I, that's what you do. It didn't cross my mind really. It did. I mean, he, 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 he could have been out of the game. I just think, I mean, it was very early third quarter. Don't care. Up 30. Um, super concerning for not just this series, but for the rest of the playoffs, I would say. I know you want the Nuggets and probably not the Blazers, but I mean, he just just doesn't look right. CP? Yeah. I mean, he was starting to. He hit a three before that. I mean, he he hasn't had an MRI. Everyone's saying he's going to play tonight. Uh, So I'm not completely discouraged, but it is, I mean, it's clearly going to be a thing that lingers and affects him moving forward. So it's all about, you know, how how can he manage it? Yeah, Yeah. how do you manage it? Yeah. Um, And then in terms of AD, you can pretty much listen to every episode post AD going down for that first injury to know, like, I knew he was fucked. This dude gets injured all the time. All the time. Yeah. You want to know how psycho of a fan I am? I'm still like... You're scared. Oh, by no means am I like comfortable. Because AD is sending like gang signs to the fans in the back being like six. I'm coming back for six. And it's like, no, you're not. Yeah. What was funny was like the the article I read about that. It said uh, like AD eyeing game six return. And then like the first thing like said that, that he had motioned six or whatever. And then everything after that, like none of it was encouraging. (laughs) So it was like (laughs) that your headline is that he. (laughs) LeBron's like, don't rush it. That's how you knew LeBron was like, we're done for the year. We're shutting it down don't rush it don't rush it it's like you're done you're done because if you don't rush ad back from this groin strain you lose you go home end of the season it's a wrap it's a wrap and that's fine like i get that you don't want to play around with injuries for the long term because ad is so young but boy boy even snoop knows this team is getting fucking cooked he went in on ig people hate me when i say the word soft but soft is a word that people throw around and snoop Threw it the fuck around. He said, he sounds like me. Never thought I'd say it, but we sorry. (laughs) True. And the Clippers better than us. True. Frank Vogel can't coach. True. (laughs) And why the fuck is Montrez Harrell ain't getting no run? True. Fuck, this is heartbreaking. AD is hurt more than Mary J. Blige records. (laughs) True. We soft. True. And don't call my phone. I'm going down. I mean, yes, AD is always fucking hurt. 
always. What a brutal loss for the Lakers. Things you hate to see as a Portland Trailblazers and a Sun fan. It's yeah, just awful. I mean, they're, they're fans, truly. I mean, I said it on the last pod, but they really have been through so much, and they're deserving of all good things. So, yeah, thoughts and prayers for Lakers fans. Thoughts and prayers. Can't say I saw a fucking second of that game. I only saw it on, on social media because <laughs> Marty, Dame time. Oh, yeah. We, the collective we in all of the NBA on Twitter, just every fan on earth except for you, Marty, experience. Did you watch that game? I, okay, after the CP injury, I was just like, okay, can't focus on that. And it was like, it was like nearing the end of the fourth quarter in the Blazers game. So I did switch over to like take my mind off of it. So I saw, I saw all the good parts. We experienced something historic. Even Kevin Durant was at a loss for words. He like changed. He tried to tweet like four different times. He even said, I concocted four different tweets. We experienced what KD called himself God mode. Trailblazers went down 22 early. I have to tell you, that was not the kind of effort. You saw me. I was tweaking before the game. Yeah. Tweaking. I watched that video back and I was like, man, I was on one. <laughs> on one. Then Dame Dalla put the team on his fucking back. And somehow, some way, we're only down three at halftime. And like, truthfully, I think the take home message is that the Nuggets don't respect the history of the game. They really just don't care about basketball because if they did, they'd allow the Blazers to win that game. They would have allowed us to have that because what would it be historically if we won that game? Going down 22, the preordained Damian Lillard speech that he gave to all the team members that was written about by The Athletic and Jason Quick. And then to come out, go down 22, grit and grind, fucking go God mode and win game five on the road. I mean, that's a 30 for 30. <laughs> he, they stole a 30 for 30 from us. It, yeah, it really is insane that he gave us all of that and it was a loss. It really is nuts. That's just, that's just very disrespectful to the <laughs> game. Is I mean, that's the most heroic performance in a loss, maybe ever. Yes. Like, I'm trying to, I, I honestly, I'm just now thinking of that. Yeah, that would actually be kind of fun to think about, but it's it's up there. It's in, it, that's, that's top three, top five. Top three, top yeah. five. Like, that was more impressive than the Reggie Miller, like, how many ever threes he hit in the last, like, 20 seconds. Sure. Yeah. 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 Because Dame hit three threes. He hit three straight threes. Three straight yeah. threes. And that, like, rainbow, oh, oh. Damian Lillard, 55 points, 10 assists. The best in postseason history, 12 for 17 from three. All-time record for made threes. Game-tying threes in the final seconds and in regulation and in overtime. He had three three three-pointers. The rest of the team, (laughs) fucking trash. Well, for years, 12 was just the all-time record. Yes. Yeah, like, not just playoffs. (sighs) CJ, terrible game. 18 points, 7 for 22. Just a bad mistake going out of bounds. That is unacceptable. Yeah. Blazers also not helped by the refs. Couple of like, Nurkic had three moving screens, three illegal screens. Listen, you could call that every fucking time. Why are you doing that? He's not even tilting his hips that much. Yeah, they have been calling that a lot more this year than past years, though. Yeah. I mean, David Lee used to do that shit all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, fuck these guys. <laughs> this is just rude. You can't, you could call that once every three plays, probably. Yeah. I was optimistic. I was exuberant. I had frenetic injury in like energy. It was something maybe I've never felt in the history of being a Blazer fan, which was like I could picture the finals in my mind. <laughs> like I could picture it. I could see it. You know, us playing the Nets like 147, 138s, you know, like who knows? Nobody plays defense. It's just all offense. Like, I was excited, and the balloon popped, of course, and then I was like, you know what? Hope is a useless emotion in sports. Useless. Completely useless. And it's like being scarred by a relationship where you're like, I don't want to love again. I never want to love again. I'm never going to have hope in a game. Just like, we came out with all of that, and then we just just trailed off. And like, Damian Lillard, right? Is just, I was so excited for my team, for my city, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm simultaneously so, so sad for Dame. Like, Rocco, Rocco, Robert Covington, and that, not only that Miss Bunny at the end, 
of the game in regulation. Also, the the missed fucking rim check dunk on the back of the. What do you even call a dunk like that that goes off the rim? Is it still a rim check? I don't even know. But like, how do you try to throw a hammer in that situation? Get the fucking points. Just get the points. Like, Why are you trying to make a statement right now? Jason Richardson lost the Suns a game a million years ago. It wasn't and wasn't nearly this big a game because of that. And I I've hated him forever because of it. Get the goddamn points, like. I mean, these guys, these dummies are not doing my God any fucking favors like these dummies. My God, Damian Lillard. I was like full. I was like a full religious zealot running around, (laughs) running around preaching for Dame. And like Denver just fuck us, fucked us over out of history. So I am a Dame believer. I think you will never trade CJ, even though like. I think the calls to trade CJ were so great. Then, like, after that, I don't think that's going to happen because CJ historically has cooked Denver. Cooked them. What do you think? What What do you think? Just, like, get rid of them? Get rid of CJ? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think Dame would be super happy about that. He's a big loyalty guy. So I, I think you... I think if you're Portland, you have to. You're basically at will to Dame Lillard. So whatever it's, Dame it's says, kind goes. Of, it's kind of his call. <laughs> like, I mean, we better fucking win Game Six. We better win it. Yeah. Like if we lose, CJ was like, "I hate to see that Dame's performance was wasted." It's like you fucking stepped out of bounds. I mean, you played 50 minutes and scored 18 points. Like, <sighs> yeah. I like, expect Portland to win, though. I do. I do too. I am a Dame believer, but if we so in my mind, I think to myself this, what are like, what do religious zealots say when something bad happens? What do they say? They say it's all for a greater purpose, right? Yeah. The greater purpose is that we will win game six and we will win game seven in a more historic fashion in the entire series, this run to the finals, maybe a title that we win. We won't win. But that's the that's the religious zealot in me where I'm like, yeah, like this is just a bump in the road to our title contention, you know, our title road. Sure. Yeah. Or or like since I'm not religious, nothing fucking matters. And it was just an amazing performance that will go down in the history of almosts. Fuck, we better win tonight. (laughs) All right. Sixers Wizards. I mean. That's kind of what we thought it was going to happen. The Wizards are yeah. not that great. The Sixers can do whatever they want with just Ben Simmons, Matisse Thybul, and the rest of the gang. They don't need Embiid. That starting lineup last night was weird. Like, uh, uh, like who was the five? Like, I don't even know. Like, they Tobias? Had Dwight, they had Dwight Howard on there for a little bit. They had Tobias. He didn't. St- Dwight he didn't, didn't start, start though. though. Yeah, like, it was weird. Yeah. They went small, which is what yeah. I think they might do against the Hawks. I would. I would, too. Yeah. They could beat the Wizards, like, even if the Wizards la- lost or won last game, uh, I think they could have still won the series with Embiid for sure. So this Embiid injury is no fucking joke. Again, talking to the PTs, they said meniscus tear, rut row. This is in his healthy knee, for one. Two, it's a full tear in the lateral, and it's going to be hampering him regardless if he can play or not. This but- would normally be a one-month-long injury. Sitting out. No, I thought it was a partial tear. It's, it's yep, full. Still it's full. Does, so I, they said like even still it would be a one month long recovery or you would snip okay. it out. Okay. Mm. So I think what they will do is avoid playing him as long as they possibly can. As long as they can. Bottom line, Sixers are good. Uh, and that's really all I have to say. Ben Simmons also very aggressive. Triple double. Scorer. Sixers win. Do it every single time. Embeedless. Sixers versus Hawks would be really fun. So, yeah, yeah, I was just saying this last night. I was like, the Sixers are more fun without Embiid. <laughs> I'm not saying what that. What I mean by that is like, there's more parody with the other team. Yeah, like, they, it's not a curb stomp. No, it's going to be much more. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, be a much more yeah. entertaining series. That's all I mean. Yeah, I don't, oh, yeah, for like, sure. I would for sure rather have Embiid if I was a Sixers fan or the Sixers organization. But like, as a fan, it's much more fun. Yeah, no. And they won't have to guess who they're going to throw out to defend uh, Trey Young. Correct. Correct. <laughs> exactly. Late in games. That exactly. Won't, that, that won't be a coaching decision. Exactly. Um, and then Hawks versus Knicks. They need a star. Knicks need a star. They have no they star. Do. They do. Probably Julius Randle is not going to get his contract this summer anymore. They're going to wait. Like eight GMs have said, gone on record about this, and like seven of them 
have said that they would wait to give him the contract, let let him see how that goes for one more year, that he's not a max player. So many narratives now coming back to haunt Julius Randall. Like you said, Pelicans Randall, uh, <laughs> Lakers Randall. So he did not play well. Um, Hawks played solid defense on him. Apparently, John Collins was on him the most. Yeah. And John Collins was cooked for him, cooked against him in the regular season. And this time, great. Yeah, he and Hunter kind of tag teamed it. Yep, yeah, for sure. Knicks had no answer for Trey. None, which I thought was very surprising given this was a top five defense all year. Um, Frank Nelikina could have been the linchpin to this <laughs> yes or no going seven. Filthy Frank. Filthy Frank. Like, get him out of the league. Get him out of the fucking league. Um and also brilliant coaching decision, coaching moves from Nate McMillan. I stand up. I put my hand up. I was wrong. I said Nate McMillan wouldn't get out of the first round and I'd be crowing, running around the streets. I was wrong. He he was good. He was good. But he it has been 20 years. So like if you were a statistical person that was a betting person, like if you hadn't been out of the first round in 20 years, like you could probably bet that he wouldn't this time. But he also said we needed to make sure that we closed it out in MSG because we didn't want to give the Sixers rest, which I thought was shrewd, very shrewd. So, yeah, he's been taking care of business. Again, wrong on Nate McMillan. Hawks get Sixers. We will preview that on Monday show. <sighs> Utah is for real. Yes, they are. They look real. They do. I don't think they get out of the West still because it's Utah. <laughs> That's only why. Uh, that would not be a, a, a shocker if they did not get out. Now uh, you got Mike Conley who has a hamstring injury. Mm -hmm. They're saying that is, he's saying no big deal, just a little tweak, but I think it's a big deal. Spider's ankle still sore. Um, Jazz hit 17 or more threes in the last four games. Whew. That's a lot of threes. Yeah. That's a shitload of shooting. I mean, they led the league. They led the league to their they, credit. They led the league yep. in threes. Do you think that continues against a team that can actually defend the perimeter? I mean, we beat them three times. The Suns beat them three times in in the regular season. I I like the matchup uh, a little bit. Again, like we Suns still have business to do, so not getting ahead at all. But yeah, they have looked the best in the West. I I, I would say. Granted, they were playing the eight seed, so they should. They should. But yeah, they're like the Sixers in that they have the glide path, and they should have the glide path because they were the yeah. number one number one seed. Man, you would be feeling really good, wouldn't you, if you were the one seed right now? I would have liked to see how they played the Lakers and how uh, the Suns played the Grizzlies, like how it would have worked. I would like, too. I don't, yeah. Every time Quinn Snyder has led a team to the second round, he's lost his starting point guard in the process. 2017, George Hill uh, didn't play as the Jazz got swept by the Warriors. 2018, Ricky Rubio was out for Utah's loss to the Rockets. And now, who knows, with Mike Conley playing a, the winner of Mavs Clippers, which will probably be mad. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll talk about the Grizzlies in the offseason, but man, was that a fun team to get into the playoffs. Oh, yeah. I'm happy for them. I'm happy for Jaw. He's <laughs> arrived. He's finally going to be seen. I think that the best thing about the Memphis Grizzlies getting into the playoffs was that the NBA will respect them in terms of nationally televised games. Mm. They were the least nationally televised team in the league. Yeah, no, he's the man. He's the man. He is the man. Is he already on Grizzlies Mount Rushmore? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Like in the middle <laughs> like of it. Conley, Gasol, Zebo, and Correct. Ja. Correct. Love me some Zebo. He's all he averaged 30 in this series, most by any Grizzly ever. <laughs> it's he has been him and Trey and Dame have been mm -hmm. it. Like must see TV. Yeah. Uh Rudy Gobert last night, 23 points, 15 rebounds, three blocks, 10 for 13. Gobert is the second player in NBA history to average at least 15 points per game and 10 rebounds while shooting 75% or better from the field in the best of seven playoff series. Pretty sure Aiton is on track to do that as well, weirdly. Uh yeah. Aiton is Aiton has been tremendous yeah. this series. And I think he's gonna continue to be really good. Donovan Mitchell last night, 30 points, six rebounds, 10 assists. Mitchell is the first player in Utah Jazz history to record at least 30 points, five rebounds, and 10 assists in a playoff game. He's also the first player in franchise postseason history to record a 30-point game while playing less than 30 minutes. Wow. So yeah, Utah Jazz Suns Western Conference Finals. That's that's it right It'd be there. Entertaining, yeah. <laughs> if if the Blazers lose tonight, which you'll know by the, by the time this episode comes out, yeah. tomorrow or Friday when this episode is out, um, I'm rooting for the Suns the whole way out. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. I am rooting for the Suns the whole way up. I just thank you. First off, just want to just just want to thank you for that. Uh, as far as the Jazz go, doesn't it just seem weird? Like I just can't picture Rudy Gobert holding the Larry O'Brien Trophy. No, or Donovan Mitchell any at of all. Them. Yeah, at all. Now we're going to clean up just a little around the league cleanup. A lot of talk recently about the dislike between Jay Crowder and LeBron James. The best that might be the best matchup going. <laughs> in the playoffs. That was the rivalry that's been bubbling. Mm-hmm. I didn't even realize was bubbling. And now it's like fully boiling. Yeah. He, cle- th- yeah, he clearly annoys them. Clearly they <laughs> don't like each other. And so I was doing a little digging. One of the things that I like about Jay Crowder is one, he's a fucking dog. And two, he's loyal. Yeah, he's- loyal to his guys. This goes back to one, the time that Jay and Isaiah Thomas were both Celtics playing against LeBron James for all those playoff runs mm-hmm. where LeBron went to like a million straight finals. And two, when Jay Crowder and Isaiah Thomas were shipped to Cleveland for Kyrie Irving. And then all of a sudden, LeBron James discarded. That was pretty much the end of Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. He discarded Isaiah for Larry Nance Jr. and Jordan Clarkson to oh, yeah. the Lakers. And then quickly discarded Jay Crowder to Utah. And Jay Crowder told a couple of reporters, could not wait to get the fuck out of Cleveland. Hated it there. Hated the culture. Hated playing with LeBron. Don't like LeBron and hate what he did to my guy, IT. Yeah. I mean, th- uh, that was the worst stretch of his career. Uh, I think if you go look, I, did, I don't have numbers in front of me, but I would I would be surprised if that he wasn't looked true. awful. He looked yeah, dead. He was bad in Cleveland. Yeah. And he was not well liked with the organization. They They weren't taking care of him. He wasn't a good cultural fit. And you're talking about Jay Crowder, the glue guy, like the guy that you put on the opposing team's best defender to like get him and get him mad. And now what we're seeing is like LeBron James just wanting to give Jay Crowder the business every single time down. It's like so fun to watch. Love that. Love that. Uh, How hot is this rivalry? You may ask. I clipped a second, a seven second wordless interaction between Jay Crowder and LeBron James, and it got over 500,000 views on TikTok in and 30 like 30,000 likes on in 24 hours. That's that's how spicy that rivalry is. So I cannot wait for tonight's game. All right. More drama between Nike and Vanessa Bryant. Vanessa Bryant ended her relationship with Nike, right? We know that. Uh, but before she did, they were in talks to create this Mamba C tissue um, for Gigi Bryant. Black and white only uh, for the Mamba Cita colorway with the uh, black, we'll call it like snakeskin design mm-hmm. with Kobe's name on one sneaker, Gigi's on another with the two on it. And she told Nike, I want to sell these shoes in honor of Gigi and I want all proceeds to go to the Mamba Cita Foundation. And then... All of a sudden, the relationship ended for whatever reason. I think she believed that she wasn't going to get enough from Nike to honor her husband. Or she didn't think that they were honoring him the right way or something about how many Nikes they were producing. There's a lot of scuttlebutt about why. So then she was like, no more shoes getting produced. So then the prototypes of these Mambasitas got produced and they were planning. Nike was still planning to, to put them out in the summer of this year. The the designs got leaked on like sneaker news and some of the shoes got put on Goat and on Flight Club for like $2,000. So <laughs> Vanessa Bryant went on IG today and was like, yo, what the fuck? Like, this is dirty. She said, I don't even have a pair myself. This is what she said on Instagram. The Mamba Cita shoe is not approved for sale. And all proceeds were supposed to go to the Mambasita Sports Foundation. Nike has not sent any of these pairs to me or my girls. I do not know how someone else has their hands on shoes that I personally designed for Gigi myself and sent the designs to Nike in honor of my daughter. And we don't have any. I hope these shoes never get sold. They've been sold. They are not on Flight Club anymore. Someone's got them on their feet. So holy fuck. Is that bad? I have no idea what's going to happen with that moving forward. That's a tough story. I mean, what a <laughs> what an awful look for Nike. I mean, shit. Like, 2021 has not been kind to Nike. Yeah. Yuck. Fuck them. Fuck them. In shocking news, uh, Eric Pincus of Bleacher Report dropped a bombshell when he said, this is the news, Marty. Are, we, are you ready? This is the news. 
I've he dropped it. the bombshell when he said conclusively, not speculatively, that Chris Paul intends to decline his $44.4 million option with the Suns. Things I did not see coming. That was one. Yeah, we're focused on the Lakers in game six. <laughs> Let me say this. The Chris Paul saga, fascinating. Fascinating. Because even with the shoulder injury, I don't think Chris Paul's value is any higher than it is right this moment. I mean, he's going to continue playing. So, and like he has until the end of this. I mean, if he just, I don't know, God forbid, keeps getting hurt, it might go down a little bit. But right now, yeah, I mean, he's still worth that much money for sure. I think absolutely he is worth because you take the 44, he declines that, and he says he wants more than $100 million over the course of the next three years, yeah. which is just over 33 and change, right? He's getting 44 and a half. So is he worth 27 a year for the next two years after that first year? Yeah, kind of, maybe. So I think that puts the Suns in a tricky position because it's like, well, you have to make that decision yay or nay now. And if you don't win the title this year, I think you say yay. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. You bring it back. That The same people that like are amongst like Suns Twitter, the, the same people that are of the opinion that we should decline the option or not try to re-sign him are the same people that didn't want to trade Ubre and Rubio for him. Like they're just scared, don't understand. Like you have to make moves like this. You have to eat money sometimes. It's a no brainer to me. So like it really doesn't affect how I view this team that much right now. I think you know this about Chris Paul. He's a very smart, very shrewd businessman who understands the power and the nature of leverage. He was the MBPA president for many years, so he understands how negotiations works very well. Uh And I think he's going to get his money from the Suns, and I think he deserves that money from the Suns. And fuck it, like even if he ends up getting hurt, I still think he can turn, and the sell to me is like, I think I can turn DeAndre Ayton into a top three center in the league. Yeah. And I think I turned Devin Booker into a top three shooting guard in the league. Regardless. Yeah. Like his presence, even if he's not like fully there and effective. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Actually, I didn't quite think of that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it just is kind of funny that three years, it's like, that's that third year is like right at the point where you're just not going to want to do it. But I mean, that's why that, that's what happens with all these mega deals now, though. Like you you take it like, you know, it might hurt like in the last year or the last two years, but it's worth it. You're like, willing to yeah. sacrifice the future yeah. for the right now. And Chris Paul is the right guy for right now. And he just squeezed an extra fifty six million dollars out of the Suns because I guarantee you they're paying it. That's all the time that I have for the This League podcast. Please subscribe. Please rate. Please review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify makes a huge difference. We also have This League playoff merch on sale in the Barstool store. Do not forget to follow us at, at This League and at Trista Crick on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, thank you for listening. Tune in Monday afternoon for the next episode of This League.